<clears throat> the Trail, Chapter 14. Let me put some light on this. It gets colder and colder. Earlier, the wind had been cool and pleasant in the midday sun. Now it feels crueler, carving away at my body's heat minute by minute, making me squint so my eyes don't dry out. Without the sun, the mountains feel like they're turning against me. If we recall in chapter 13, he's decided to continue hiking in the dark. Dangerous move. This is the first time that I've been caught without a shelter after sunset. Even snug in a bed, I hate the dark. But now, with no protection, anything on the mountain can attack me. After a half hour, even the dim twilight is gone. Night creeps up around me. All I have is the light of the stars. The moon hasn't risen yet. I can barely see the trail, and I consistently trip over rocks jutting up from the path that would have been easy to see in daylight. Coyotes howl in the distance. It sounds like there are dozens of them. I start to panic. Thinking about how easy it would be for them to surround me, rip open my pack and eat all my food, then gnaw my arm for dessert. Gross. My breath becomes noisy, shallow gulps. Every whoosh of wind, every falling rock that clatters down the mountain makes my heart jump. I swear I can see zombies moving down below. But then Moose whines. I know that I can't freak out. I put a hand on his trembling head. I'm right here, buddy, I tell him. I will my voice to be steady. Both of us can't be scared. One of us has to be brave. Zombies can't climb this high. I whisper to myself as I descend below the tree line. The trees block out the wind, but they also make it impossible to see more than a couple of feet ahead. The thick dark presses on me from all sides as I trudge along. I start telling Moose stories to keep my mind from going crazy with fear. Once upon a time, there was a zombie. He saw a nice juicy boy and his dog walking along a mountain and climbed up to eat them. But then a pack of coyotes surrounded the zombie and ate him instead. And the boy and the dog were safe. Moose whimpers. I keep on talking, trying to keep both of us from being paralyzed with fright. Then... I run out of stories. I make up songs. The dark is stupid, the dark is stupid. I warble. My voice sounds small and tiny. Moose starts to howl. My singing isn't bad. I tell him, but he doesn't stop. I peer into the darkness. I can't see a thing now. It's too dangerous to keep going. I'm doomed. Toe, your headlamp. It's Lucas's voice in my head, saving my butt once again. Duh. I had forgotten that one of my most important pieces of equipment is sitting in the top pocket of my pack, just waiting to be used. Fear has turned my mind to mush. Moose is still howling as I dig out my headlamp and pull the strap around my head. Even if I'm bone tired, as long as I can see my way forward, I can make it to the Garfield Ridge shelter. Moose is barking now. Stop making so much noise, I snap. I'll get you more treats when we get to the shelter. I switch on my light, and in the glare of the sudden beam, I catch two dark, side-set eyes coming straight at me. Ah! It all hits me at once. The sharp, musty smell, the coarse-haired, lumbering body, the flash of wet teeth, claws scraping the dirt. I scream again as the bear rises onto its hind legs. It towers over me and Moose, and for a second, I think we're both goners. And then the bear trips onto its back and paws at its eyes. It snorts and shakes its head and then rolls back onto its feet and crashes into the bushes, sniffling and snuffling the entire way. I've scared a bear. My terror drains away and I start laughing as waves of relief wash over me. Black bears are easily uh, terrified. If you make enough noise or startle them, they're big scaredy cats. Brown bears, not so much. Those are the ones you got to watch out for. I'm sorry, I tell Moose. I swear I will pay more attention to you next time. In the light of my headlamp, I feed him the milk bone treats right then and there on the trail. It's close to midnight by the time we reach the shelter. No one is inside. Sean and Denver must have set up their tent elsewhere. I'm too tired to pitch my own tent, so I lay my sleeping pad onto the wooden floor 
and curl up in my sleeping bag. Moose pads warily into the shelter. He circles a few times before collapsing next to me. He lays his head gently on my chest. I reach out and put my arm across his, across his skinny side. He smells like rotten eggs, but I don't care. As I drift off, I make a promise to myself to never again get caught on the trail after dark. If that bear had decided to attack me and Moose, we would have been toast. I would have never finished the trail and kept my vow to Lucas. Hmm, interesting. He made a vow. What's a vow? Yeah, it's a, it's a very serious promise. And even if it had been Moose that had gotten hurt, I wouldn't have known what to do. I don't know the first thing about treating big injuries on myself, much less a dog. I probably wouldn't have been able to save him. I can't be irresponsible. I have to protect Moose. And that means being smarter than I was today. I should have swallowed my pride and stayed at the hut instead of charging ahead in the dark. But I wanted to prove to Sean that I could keep up with him. And it had almost ended in disaster. I think that's an aha moment. Should Toby be hiking to prove to Sean? Or should he be hiking to fulfill his vow? Moose begins to snore. I smile and give his stinky head one last rub. Good night, buddy, I whisper. And this is a text feature that this author is using. Mika Hashimoto drops in a line with an, out, uh, with an outline of a character. In this case, it's a bear uh, to let us know that there is a change in the text. Right now, we're going to hop into a dream. That night, I have a dream about Lucas. We're standing at the bottom of a waterfall where there's no water coming down. Suddenly, rivers of clear marbles ribboned with blue cascading with blue cascade off the top of the falls twinkling bright globes that crack into tiny pieces as they hit the rocks next to us i feel a wave of grief hit me at, at all the broken pieces but when i look at lucas he's laughing as the shattered marbles pile up they turn into a river a river of glittering light and i realize that i've broken things i can't turn into something beautiful let's try that again I realize, epiphany, that even broken things can turn into something beautiful. When I wake up for the first time in a long while, I'm smiling. I wonder why he's dreaming about marbles. Is there a connection to another part of the story? What do you guys think? 